Okay, hello everybody. My name is Iri Olsha. I work for Red Hat. I maintain the perf for uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And I also do some work uh, upstream. I will be talking uh, in this presentation about uh, processor tracing that uh, we support uh, in the perf. In the nutshell, it's a feature that allows you to go from functional level detail that you might note, for example, from uh, F-trace, which is this output, and you can go all the way uh, to the instructions. So that's what processor trace is uh, allowing you to, to do. It's basically, you will get the total overview uh, about your workload. You will get all the instructions that were executed uh, in your workload. As maybe some of you might notice, this is the x86 uh, instructions output, and this is basically the scope of my uh, presentation. Uh, in Perf, we have actually uh, like global framework for processor tracing, and we have we support and other architectures. Also, we have implementation of processor tracing for S390 and ARM, the core side. However, uh, I will be covering only x86 and namely uh, the Intel. Intel models and features today. So it gives you the, the processor trace gives you the uh, instructions, uh, instructions flow. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, you don't need to be familiar with the assembly with small exceptions, and those are branch instructions, uh, because that's what the processor trace and other related features are based on. I will just uh, really quickly explain uh, what are branch instructions about. Basically, they control uh, the flow. They, uh, whenever the CPU reach the branch instructions, it allows to see the CPU to jump to another portion uh, in the memory. So basically, they are used for uh, conditions, for uh, function calls. There are two types. It's, really, uh, it's either unco unconditional jump uh, this jump will happen every time that CPU reach the instruction or there are conditional jumps and based on the type of the jump and based on some flags inside the processor which are checked before the jump, uh, the CPU either jumps uh, to a new location or not. So those are branch, branch instructions and they are really crucial for processor tracing. I will start with really fast and quick example to keep you interested. First of all, you need to find out if the processor tracing is available on your system and the best way to do that is uh, to do the perf list and look for the Intel underscore uh, PT. Basically, it's uh, Intel underscore PT is basically the PMU itself that provides one single event, Intel PT. And this is the event you want to use when uh, you use the processor trace on the Intel. I have this sophisticated example. If you want trace program like this, you run perf record dash e Intel PT. You will say that dash u, uh, this uh, u modifier means that you want to trace only the user space, and you specify specify the program. So the program was running. Uh, in the perf data, you have now uh, the trace of the program, and now you can display uh, what you actually traced, and that's what we have the iTrace option for. If you want to see all the instructions, you can say i0. Ah, now it's too small. Good. Like this. Still. Here you go. Okay, I will use the error. Uh, this output basically gives you for every instruction, uh, you will synthesize an uh, instruction event sample. So every line now stands for uh, instruction. You can uh, display more details for every instruction. You can display the actual instruction that got executed. And you can display it very nicely in the hex dump, or you can <laughs> translate the hex dump. And this is uh, basically all the instruction that got executed when you run the X command that uh, I was showing in the beginning. So if I go and search for main function, 
you will find out basically the routine that you wrote. This is the preparation for uh, for libc calling, and all around the main function is basically the dynamic loiter and the libc libc glue. So if you wish, you can check all that code, and it always amazes me how how much of the code is executed just for 12 instructions. So that was just a quick example. Uh, before I actually go and introduce the processor trace itself, uh, I will introduce two other features that uh, are like the predecessor of the processor trace because processor trace in Intel didn't just appear by itself. There, were, there was some uh, de development. Uh, one of those features is actually a dead end. That's the branch trace store. Last branch record still continues and people are uh, using it. Let me start with that. Uh, last branch record is basically uh, the CPU feature. And CPU uh, allows you to uh, configure the CPU in a way that it will uh, remember the last branches that it executed. So at any given time, you can ask the CPU, how did you get to this point? What, are, what were the branches that you executed? And that's basically how we uh, use it in the perf. Whenever there's the sample for event, like for cycles, when you're profiling on cycles, you have the sample. And at the point of sample, we are gathering all the information, <laughs> like the processor ID, thread ID, CPU number, all those information. And one of, the, one of those information is also the LBR record. So we ask the CPU, what were the branches? How, how did we get here? And that's basically what we are storing for every branch. We store the source and destination address. And we also store like the details about the jump, uh, which is like the usual flex that you want to know about the jump, if it was predicted, mispredicted, if it was part of the transactions. And we can also get the, uh, the number of cycles that were spent uh, from the previous jump. Quite some quite of useful information to find out if you have some support on LBR uh, on your system, which you probably have because it's kind of uh, oldish feature. Uh, you just grab the kernel lock uh, for LBR, and you should see something like this. Uh, the 32 deep is basically the number of jumps that the CPU allows you to store, and it's different for uh, every architecture for. Uh, there's the small table that gives you the idea. Uh, I included this uh, structure. This is basically the structure mm, that's uh, used in the kernel to store the LBR data for the sample. And you can see all the flags that we actually uh, store uh, for, the, for the jump. So mispredicted, predicted, abort in the transaction, and how many cycles. You can see there's the reserved field, so it's actually not a dead feature. For example, these uh, cycles were added like for Skylake Sky -like architecture, so I don't know, three years ago. So it's kind of still useful, it's still there, people are using it. How we can actually use it? Uh, perf record dash B will instruct the perf to store the L LBR data for the samples. Uh, Perf record J is basically the filter. It's, it does the same as B, but you can say the type of the jumps. So it's supposed to be faster because the filter is set uh, in the hardware. So you will get a uh, faster workload. We have actually support for call chains. Also, when you say call graph LBR, the standard uh, frame pointer call chains will be mixed with the LBRs, and it will get you just uh, better call chains. Once you have uh, the LBR data uh, in your profile, you can run perf report. Uh, by default, it will actually, it will actually show you uh, the most used branch. If you, uh, there's very nice options, branch history. It will actually show you the profile and the branch, uh, the LBR data will be shown in the core chain. So I recommend using those features. How is it with the performance of LBR? Uh, I did this really simple benchmark. So the first uh, record is just the profiling of uh, standard uh, scheduler pipe bench that we have in the perf. So the baseline is like this 58 uh, seconds. 
If you include the dash B, uh, it will slow down uh, almost four times. Uh, the call graph LBR is actually uh, quite nicely, uh, nicely fast because it does just the subset of the LBR. It's, uh, it doesn't uh, delay the CPU uh, that much. So that's actually really, really usable. So that's LBR actually just instrumenting the samples with the uh, branch cores. The first feature that actually did the whole storage, like the, that uh, stored the whole trace uh, of the branches is branch trace store, BTS. And basically it's a CPU feature, of course. It allows you to configure uh, the memory, uh, the buffer in the memory. And once you configure uh, uh, the BTS, the CPU will start dumping the information about every branch that it's the execution going, uh, going through. So for every branch, it's actually storing uh, 24 bytes. Source address, destination address, and eight bytes for one flag. As I said uh, before, LBR, LBR feature is still ongoing, sort of. People are using it. <laughs> BTS is actually just a dead end. It's just the something, at least for perf, uh, something that uh, predates the processor trace. It has some common functionality, uh, but people are now using the Intel processor trace. This is like this is like that feature. However, how does that feature work? There are two ways how we can uh, actually uh, enable it, uh, and it's by using different types of events. First event is bran branch instructions with the period one. That's that's the dash C one. If you use this instruction, uh, the kernel will notice and transparently it will create the BTS buffer and the CPU will start dumping the data to the BTS buffer and there's a mechanism when the uh, BTS buffer will be full, it will be dumped and that's where kernel steps in. It will parse all the BTS buffer and for every record it will create event, branch event and store to the perf ring buffer. So perf ring buffer will have all the branch events uh, from the BTS and the decoder is the kernel. If it sounds expensive to you, it's because it's really expensive. It's really, it's really horrible from the performance uh, point of view, but it's working. The other way uh, to enable uh, the BTS is using the Intel underscore uh, BTS uh, event. And by using this event, uh, the kernel doesn't step in. Uh, the record, the user space side that's uh, monitoring the data that CPU is generating, will actually take all the data from the memory and dump it uh, to the data file. So you will basically end up with the perf data with mixed data from the BTS buffer and from the perf ring buffer. So no kernel is involved, nobody is translating the data in the kernel. That means the decoder actually moved to user space, which is a nice thing. It's supposed to be much uh, faster. And decoder is basically hidden behind the dash dash uh, itrace option. Basically, by dash dash itrace, you're saying, I have the data uh, with the hardware trace, in this case, the BTS. Synthesize from this data the thing that I will tell you to synthesize and you can synthesize all this kind of data. For BTS, uh, you can synthesize only the branches and the calls. All the other options are there because this is actually uh, the option for the Intel processor trace. So this was like the evolution of the Intel processor trace. For BTS, you can synthesize only the branches. All the, uh, all the rest of the options are available for Intel uh, processor trace. I will talk about it later. So to sum it up, uh, the branch instructions with the period one works. It's, uh, it's not fast. The Intel uh, BTS events is actually disabled for PTI feature, uh, page table isolation feature, uh, which is probably uh, enabled on most distros uh, now. So most likely you will not see it on your comp computer unless you recompile your kernel and uh, disable it. It's not well maintained at the moment. 
On top of it, uh, the BTS does just the branches, uh, nothing else. So you will just get the overview of how the branches were executed. There's no timing information and you cannot do system-wide uh, monitoring. You can do just attach the event uh, to the single thread. That's all you can do. I mentioned the overhead already. So there's the Intel processor trace to save the day because it really has uh, much lower overhead uh, mostly because it's using the dump of the processor trace is basically uh, very highly compressed data. At some point, it's even like one bit for uh, one branch. So it's really, really uh, powerful compression. And moreover, uh, it's actually uh, adding uh, more information to the trace. So you get the timing information and you can get some information about uh, the power, like the frequency of the processor at any given, any given point. It has the similar functionality from the top, uh, top level overview, like the BTS. So again, there's a buffer that you need to configure for the CPU. And when you enable the feature, the CPU will start dumping the information to that buffer. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's not 24 bytes for every branch now. Uh, it's actually the dump is uh, the processor trace dumping the information in form of the packets. Uh, many, many different packets that form some sort of protocol that describe uh, the flow. And the decoder is the guy who actually is on the other side and trying to decode that thing. How it looks like, in a nutshell, uh, this is like the basic started sequence of the packets that dis, uh, display, uh, that decodes the control flow. Uh, the first thing uh, you need to know about the processor uh, trace data is that the decoder doesn't need to know where the data begins. It gets to the data from any level, uh, from uh, any starting point, and it search for PSB uh, packet, which is like unique. And when it uh, reaches the PSB, uh, the protocol is that uh, following data will actually set up the trace. It will set up two informations. It will set up the timing, that's the TSC packet for, and it will set up the virtual address that the CPU is currently executing on. So it's, of course, much more difficult, but this is the idea. You basically find the beginning of the trace, you set up the time, you set up the virtual address, and now you are ready to decode. When you are ready to decode, there's the most common and most important packet in processor trace. It's TNT. It stands for taken, not taken. And it's decoding the branches. Basically, uh, for every conditional branch in the trace, you have one bit in this packet. So decoder needs to have the binary. It goes uh, through the code. And whenever uh, there is a conditional branch uh, in the binary, in the, in the sequence of instructions, it consults the TNT packet and based on the value, if the branch was taken or not taken, it either jumps to new location or continues executing, uh, executing further. So at some point, uh, you will see the dump. I will show you an ex uh, example, just the TNT packets uh, describing, uh, describing the flow. So that's the basic idea. That's uh, how actually the packets uh, looks like. Again, it's much more complicated. There are many more packets uh, uh, about the, uh, saying the state of the processor and the power, uh, power state. This is just simplification to show you how it works. Back uh, to how we actually store the data. It's similar to the BTS, uh, BTS trace. Uh, for Intel processor trace, the, uh, the buffer is called uh, TOPA buffer. Uh, and we deal with it like with the BTS. So we store all the data uh, from the topa buffer to perf data together with the events from the ring buffer. And again, that's mean, that means uh, that you need to have the decoder on the user space side uh, in the report and actually in the script as well. Again, the, uh, the decoder that will decode the data for you is behind the iTrace option. And for Intel processor trace, all those options are available for you. So you basically say, uh, I have the data. I have the data with uh, processor trace. Synthesize this kind of information for me. Synthesize instructions. 
you can say also the period of instructions, I will show you an example. You can uh, synthesize the branches as in BTS, transactions and power, power events and some other helper option when you try to uh, debug, uh, debug the things. Examples, let's go to examples. So I can basically start uh, from uh, where I left uh, from the previous example. So in perf data now I have the profile of the X uh, of that simple uh, X example. I have the profiling data from running that. If you actually want to check how the trace looks uh, by itself, you use the perf uh, capital capital D, which means we will give you the raw output of the data file. And if you search for the perf record aux trace event, this is the event, this is actually the raw data that we got uh, from the CPU. I'm not sure if it's visible enough, perhaps not too much. Better? Uh, yeah, you must believe me, it's there. So basically there's the PSB sequence and all the stuff and now you would see all the TNT packets here. Really, you cannot see it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, never mind, it's there. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, okay, another example. So, the key uh, to get the data from the processor trace is the iTrace option. That's actually the decoder of the data. And we have really nice main pages. We suck at the main pages, for, but for processor trace, it's really, it's really good. So, if you go for report or script and search for iTrace, much better, right? Okay. Uh, it will give you really the whole scope of what you can do uh, with the processor trace data. Uh, so as I said, basically you tell the decoder, give me, if you use the I, give me all the instructions. And the beauty of it is that you can specify also the, you can uh, specify the period. And the period can be much lower uh, than you could actually specify uh, for the hardware event. So if you use perf report and say, give me all the instructions and the period I want the instructions to be at is two nanoseconds, you will basically get the profile, uh, which like the profiling tick is uh, two nanoseconds. Uh, so this is basically you can uh, you can ch change that and change the profile. You will get different amount of uh, instructions events for every uh, period. But that basically allows you to uh, do like the profiling after the real profiling. You can you can uh, do some sort of offline offline profiling by uh, and you can use uh, really small uh, small periods. So for uh, Small workloads, it can show you some uh, meaningful, meaningful data. Uh, to actually see the whole flow, uh, I was using this iTrace, iTrace uh, with the instruction of zero. So this will give me all the, all the instructions. Uh, we have uh, several options that we uh, in encode it uh, to standalone, uh, standalone options, which you can use. So if you say call trace, it will configure the decoder to give you just the calls and the returns. And it will basically show you uh, the call graph of the execution uh, from, the, from the call trace, uh, from the processor uh, trace dump. So if I go to see the main function, you will see that is just the main being executed over here. It goes for the F right. You will see the dynamic loader kicking here and the actually I write uh, over here. Uh, we have some variation on those, uh, on those options. This one <coughs> will show you the call graph together with the instructions, which is really helpful sometimes to get an idea of what was actually executed under that, under that uh, functions. You can also trace the kernel, of course, and you can trace it uh, system-wide. 
the only thing you change on the command line I was using is that instead of, uh, okay, <laughs> I don't go like here. So you go perf record, Intel, PT, and instead of U, you say K, you say system wide, and you say you want this for one second. So now I have the one second uh, profile, uh, processor trace uh, of the whole, whole system. You can uh, run a perf script saying call trace, and this will basically gets you uh, the executions, uh, exe uh, like the idea of what was executed uh, during this one second. Uh, there's a little glitch in tracing uh, the kernel. Uh, the thing is that the kernel is not static. Uh, we have all these jump labels things that basically changing uh, the kernel uh, code uh, on the fly. So, and the decoder is going through the debug info, so at some point the decoder will not recognize, uh, it will not match because the executed code is actually different than we have in debug info. So basically you will get errors like, yeah, trace doesn't match the instruction. We have working out on that. Uh, in the perf, uh, perf RPM, we have the following script, perf with kcore, Okay, maybe I can make it huge. Okay. Uh, per with KCOR. Uh, what this will actually uh, do for you is it will run the profile the same way as you if you wouldn't use it. But at the end of the profile, it will store the KCOR information uh, from the kernel. So you will get actually the image uh, of the code that was used during your profile. And it will also, it will use it in a way that it's available for report uh, and script. So the example is uh, like here, I need to remove previous data. Okay, you say record the name of the data, the event for kernel, system wide and for one second. It's recording the data and at the end it will store the key core for you. So if you look to the data, it will create actually the directory. Uh, there's, the, there's the data together with the key core information. And when you run perf script pt call graph, call graph script pt, call trace, sorry you will get now like the, uh, the correct trace without uh, any errors because we are using the KCore to uh, resolve uh, all the data. One last thing I'd like to mention before the end is the snapshot mode. Uh, basically, uh, even though the data is highly uh, uh, compressed, it's still a lot of data if the CPUs are busy and you want to trace for a long time. Uh, the guys from Intel introduced a uh, snapshot mode, which basically it will set up everything uh, as for the not snapshot mode, but it will not store the data. It will just wait uh, for you. You need to send the signal to the record command. And once the record gets the signal, it will dump the data uh, to the data file. So uh, by this, you can actually run the trace and there are still some data that got stored to the data file. It still be, will be populated. We have some uh, helping events uh, to, track the, uh, to track the scheduler, like who, who is running at the moment. So it will still go, but it's not so much. And it will, uh, at, at the point you actually want to store the data, you send the signal and you will get uh, the amount uh, of the data uh, in, your, in your data file. From performance point of view, this is the comparison, is the same benchmark I use for uh, LBR. I didn't measure the not snapshot mode because it's really, uh, I wouldn't have enough space for uh, this uh, bench, it's really a lot of data. But if you do the snapshot mode, uh, the performance is even slightly better than uh, for the call graph uh, LBR, so it's uh, in this mode, it's really usable even 
let it run over your workload. Uh, it's it's uh, it's actually not that not that bad. I will skip that one. Just to the, give the credit to the guys who make it, those are the Intel guys. And again, it's lower overhead. You can do the system wide, and there's the timing information. And that's it from me. Actually. If there are any questions? I heard something that mm, it's supported in the K KVM now, but I don't know the details. It's not my area. <laughs> Sir? I repeat the question. If there is the support in QMO. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Even if yeah. you just concentrate on Intel, do you can tell us the, the, the capability of PERT on the V hardware on the RM is the same? Uh, so the question is about uh, the support for uh, S390, the, the Z. Uh, it came just a uh, few months ago, so I believe it's there. I've never used it. I don't have the hardware. And yeah, it's coming in. The patches are coming in. It's being egg, so I guess it must be in some shape that is actually working. So <laughs> never use it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.